That works. Great. Good morning. Well, my name's Simon, if we haven't met yet, and it's uh, great to be here. Like, what a cracker of a morning. I don't know if you caught a glimpse of Mount Gillen as you're on the way to church this morning with the sort of grey sky and the sun and the shadow on there. I just thought, far out, we're lucky to live here. Uh, what a beautiful place. It's pretty amazing to think that everyone sitting here and joining us online, somehow, by God's working, we're here together on this day, at this place, all these different stories and life histories and family histories and cultural backgrounds and, you know, people with family who've been here for thousands of years, people who've rocked up in the last week uh, on a holiday. Here we are together, the body of Christ. And this morning we continue our Imperfect Fit series. Now, I don't want to send anyone to sleep before we get started, but I do want to ask you to close your eyes, please. And I can see you if you're not closing your eyes. Uh, Close your eyes, please, and not to pray, but to think of someone, picture someone that you spend a lot of time with. Could be a family member, work colleague, close friend, anyone. All right, while you're thinking of this person, without overthinking, answer this question. What are they known for? From your perspective. What is the reputation they have? Think about, while eyes are still closed, how did they become known for whatever it is that they are known for? How did that come to be, whether positive or negative? All right, as you open your eyes, I'd love to hear from one or two people. Positive reputations, please. <laughs> like, this is not the time to like, publicly just call someone out for something. But let's, uh, if you had a positive one come to mind, Alex, good on you, I'm coming to you with a mic, and then one more person after Alex would be great. Who are they and why and how did that reputation come to be? Um, I thought about my sister who lives in town and I just thought about kindness immediately and that's based on the fact that she's lots of small kind things for people all the time. Fantastic. All right, one more, maybe from this side. I, I'm about to put a mic into my front of someone's. <laughs> Good on you, Steve. Thank you so much. You just saved everyone else from being... Uh, <laughs> I thought of my wife, Bev, and because she's a grandmother, that's what she does. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Steve. Awesome. All right. So hopefully everyone of us had something or someone in mind. Our reputation individually and collectively ultimately comes about from what we do. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter what you believe doesn't matter what you theorise about, it's what you do that day by day, moment by moment, interaction by interaction, actually influences the reputation that you and I have. Over time, those things compound to become what we are known for. For the people around us in our life, what we do really matters. You know, I think sometimes it's um, tempting if you like, to kind of think right but act however we want. Uh, In the church, in a general sense, there is a danger of I believe right and I think right and somehow disconnecting this sometimes from what we do when really it's what we do that matters. It's what we do that impacts the people around us and our community and society at large. One of the biggest little lies that the enemy might be telling us in the church is that what you do doesn't really matter as much as what you believe. Jesus didn't live that way. Jesus was and he still is one of the most controversial and intriguing people to have ever walked the earth. Um, He had a reputation. It was built and established every day by what he did and how he did it. 
The crowds were amazed at what he said, but ultimately the way that he related to murderers, tax collectors, prostitutes, fishermen, the religious elite, widows, children, it was compelling and revolutionary. In general, you know, you say Jesus walked throughout his life opposing the proud and giving grace to the humble. And particularly with his death on the cross has left this legacy or this reputation or this thing of being known for sacrificial love. It's one of my favourite verses, it's in Romans, but God demonstrates his great love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What I love about it is God demonstrates his great love. He didn't just think it upon us, he didn't just speak it upon us, he didn't just believe that he loved us, he demonstrated it by what he ultimately did. In Hebrews 11, there's a hall of fame of faith, which we don't have time to go through right now, but it is full of examples of broken but beautiful people like you and me, made in the image of God, who did something (laughs) out of the faith that they had in God. Their faith was proven real and genuine. So there's a tension and a mystery, if we just want to quickly flick to the next slide, where we'll never be saved by what we do, because we're saved by what Jesus has done, but yet the kingdom of God and the ministry of Christ through the body of Christ is only advanced and expressed when we do like Jesus would do. And so that leads us to our passage, Ephesians 4. So we can flick to that. Let's read together. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to to indulge in every kind of impurity. They are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to, be, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Just a real quick interesting thing here is in... Uh, Uh, Colossians, it talks about uh, Jesus uh, being, uh, having the fullness of the deity uh, expressed in the person of Jesus. I think sometimes when we say created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, we sometimes can all of a sudden go to this kind of esoteric kind of distant where we're what, you know, God in heaven somehow and somehow, no, no, we just need to look at Jesus. Like, Jesus was the living, walking example of how God would interact with people if he were here right now, which he is through his presence. But anyway, so so if if you allow me to paraphrase quickly, and to put on the new self created to be like Jesus in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. There's a lot in there. Let's explore. Uh, Let's get to this chicken bag over here, actually. I want to get to this chicken bag. Uh, What's in the chicken bag? I'm about to tell you. 
So I don't know about you, but I've got a habit of wearing the same clothes a lot. If I like something, I'm just going to wear it over and over and over again. Uh, the problem with wearing something over and over again is that it wears out. So this jumper, or hoodie, I've had this since I was about 19 years old. This thing is about as old as my relationship with Hales. And it's got holes in it, it's got really good fraying, but it's still intact and it works really great as a jumper. And if I'm doing stuff in the backyard, front yard, and it's cold enough to wear a jumper, oh, I love going to this one. The problem with this one now is that the hole, with the hole in the front pocket, if you put like screws in there, they fall out now when you lean over. But I'll get it patched and I'll keep wearing it and it lives on. But it's an old piece of clothing. Look at that there. Here's another one of my favourites. This pair of pants has actually been to the top of Kilimanjaro, believe it or not. That was a long time ago. These were probably 12 bucks from Kmart, Slazinger Classics. So warm and comfortable though. I tore these on a barbed wire fence, hence the patch down here, which is falling apart because I did it. But these are go-tos. I love these old clothes. So comfortable. <clears throat> now, these are not the wrecked pairs because the wrecked pairs are, are literally, they actually did make it to the rags because these are my favourite sort of running shorts. I used to work at the uh, town pool and um, all the lifeguards get these shorts. Well, the best thing about being a lifeguard at the Alice Springs Town Pool is you discover the best running shirts in the world. Nike or Adidas don't make them, Zogs make them. Uh, they've got this there, they just feel light, they dry really well, the pockets are excellent, front and back. And this is about my fifth pair of these. Now, I don't work at the pool, but I still go back to the pool to buy my running shorts. And the reasons that the other running shorts did go to the rags is because it's the crotch that wears out. So you can't keep wearing those. This is my favourite bushwalking shirt. And when I go for really long runs, I hate getting burnt, so I often wear this like on long runs. So with the recent West Max Monster run, uh, it's 230 k's long. I wore this shirt the whole way. I just love this shirt. It's like keeping your sun off in the day and at night time. Uh, it keeps you just that little bit warm. You can unbutton the buttons to, you know, sort of regulate your own heat a little bit. The problem with this shirt now is it's got a big hole in it. <laughs> That's where my pack was, my running pack was, and it just over that time just wore the biggest hole. I've still worn this shirt since. A couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, I wore this shirt hiking up to Counts Point with my son Daniel because I just love this shirt. <laughs> All right. Why am I telling you about clothes? In verses 22 to 24, oh, sorry, socks, just quickly. I'm wearing socks right now with big holes in them. But man, they're comfortable. <laughs> they're just go-tos. They're clean, but full of holes. Anyway, uh, is because Paul uses this language of putting off the old self and putting on the new self. And he's talking in the context of being made new in the attitude of our minds. And I want to ask you, what attitudes are in your wardrobe this morning? Because like clothes, attitudes are things where we, without even thinking after a while, get in the habit of putting certain attitudes on. We go to the family, uh, the family dinner. We just put certain attitudes on. We go to work, we put certain attitudes on. We come to church, we put certain attitudes on. So these attitudes can be sort of put on and taken off and there's old ones that we just really need to let go of because now we're a new person, a new creation and by God's grace there's new attitudes, new clothes for us to wear. And it goes without saying that the ones you put on affect your reputation. And not, but not even just your reputation, our reputation as a body of believers here in Alice Springs. You know, a favourite 
well, I, won't, I better not go down this track too far. But a favourite for us as followers of Jesus is the judgmental jacket. Oh, and that's done us so much harm, <laughs> hasn't it? But you know, there's also, the, there's also this wonderful one, like the compassionate T-shirt. Anyone who's actually interacted with a kind Christian neighbour or person. There's, there's, uh, there's one over here, the indifferent pants. We put on our indifferent pants. Or... I don't know, we can put on our love hat. So this is the picture I'm trying to paint, is that some of the attitudes that you've maybe been putting on for your entire life without even thinking about it are actually things that you can put on and off. Just you maybe sometimes put it on so much, it's such a habit that it's actually become a part of, you think it's a part of who you are. It's not who you are, but you think it is in the same way that there's some people who always wear the same jacket or the same hat, or the same shoes, and they become known as the person, like you, you associate every thought you have of that person with something that they wear, because they wear it all the time. That guy's got a chip on his shoulder. Oh, he's just grumpy. Oh, don't worry about him. He just sees things very black and white. Well, that's, fair. that's all well and good, but let's reflect for a second on what we're pulling out of the wardrobe every morning. Because here Paul's calling us individually, but as a body is talking to the church in a, the, in a, a thesis. <laughs> almost said, don't worry what that word I almost said. Uh, the church in a thesis, hey, be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self created to be like Jesus. The fashion house. Now, I know nothing about fashion, but I do know this. <laughs> the fashion house that creates all of the best worldly attitudes is called pride. All those attitudes build self up, protect self. They guard the ego. The fashion house that creates all of the clothes for God's family, which is all of us, is called humility. And all of those attitudes and all of those clothes build others up. So we get to choose. Now, a conundrum. Somehow it is possible to know God, possible to be a child in his family, and for whatever reason, in our wardrobe, we get to choose every single day still from the fashion house of humility or the fashion house of pride. It's like when we came to a part of God's family, all the pride clothes, all the pride attitudes didn't just get magically taken away. We've got a choice and at least until we drop dead in this life, right? At least then. You know, I'm assuming we don't have a choice later on because we've made our choice now. That's another, that's another sermon, we don't need to go into that. What we need to work out for a minute though is how can we be a follower of Jesus and we've got this choice of humility or pride attitudes essentially and somehow still every now and then, oh, that pride jacket, it just looks so good with those shoes. We pull it out, we put it on. And, yet, and also conversely, there's some people who would say themselves, no, I'm far from God, I don't believe in God, I don't even think there is a God. And they do a pretty good job of wearing the humility clothing that's designed for God's family. So, brothers and sisters, we're called to wear the clothes or the attitudes from the fashion house of humility. The same as what Jesus wore. Ultimately, the same attitudes that Jesus practiced and had a reputation for. After a little while of putting on and wearing hope and love, joy, peace, kindness, humility, grace, contentment, 
forgiveness, truth. There's a lot of clothes in the humility fashion house. You create a habit of wearing these all the time. You create uh, the attitudes that become an ongoing blessing to all of those people around you. You know, just real quick, one that I think of is Hales' grandmother recently, unfortunately passed away. Uh, She was 95. So she lived a good life and she passed away peacefully. And she, uh, my opinion, I think she deserved to pass away peacefully. She was lovely. I've only known her for 20 odd years, but I tell you what, everything about her was just like a fountain of love. Whether you were Christian or not Christian, she was a very strong Christian woman, but half of her family and grandchildren, etc., don't know Jesus. She didn't treat anyone differently. All in you know, she was just as fountain of her, 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 her jacket, her clothing from head to toe was love. And uh, uh, yeah, powerful. And that's what can happen for us is we can put on these things day after day after day and they become a habit and then before you know it, that's what we're known for. It's pretty cool. And we don't need to wait another year or 10 years to start putting on. We can actually start today. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> By God's grace and power, we can start right now. So let's keep moving. What's interesting about following Jesus is that the world and society we exist in is the same before and after as following Jesus. So uh, here I am, I'm going along in my life. When I'm about 14 years old, I surrender my life to Jesus Christ, say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. And now we're walking since then. But the world around me hasn't really changed at all. Like I went to the, back to the same high school, I hadn't changed. My family hadn't changed. My house hadn't changed. Nothing changed except what was going on inside of me by the Holy Spirit. And I'd say that's the same for everyone here, generally speaking, right? Okay, so this is interesting. So it's like when you, have, when you, when you uh, learn to swim. You, know, you see water a certain way. The water is the same whether you can swim or you can't swim. What changes is the way that you interact with it, the way that you relate to it, the way that you feel about it and think about it. If you can't swim, water's a big, big no-no. Let's stay out of the water. Right? If you can swim, yeah, let's go to the water because it's lots of fun. All right? So by the Holy Spirit, Jesus has not just removed us or plucked us out of the world. Jesus also hasn't removed all of the pride clothes out of the wardrobe in terms of the things that we can choose to walk in day by day. But I tell you what, by his spirit and by his love and his power, he transforms and reforms and shapes the way that we interact and relate with one another. If what's going on is real. The way that we engage with the people around us should be different. Can be different. And this is in really big and small ways. I love that uh, example of Alex just in terms of her sister. In so many small ways, her sister is kind. Oh, and still, by just in a small way being kind, or in a small way being faithful, or in a small way being reliable, or in a small way your yes is yes and your no is no, or in a small way, whatever it is, in a small way, over time, you do those things, they compound and become what you're known for. And that's personal as well as corporately, the small things we do, prison ministry, the small things we do, bus uh, driving around, the small things we do, just love, the small things we do, end up shaping the reputation that we have in the community. Pretty cool, if it's compounding in the right direction. Alarming if it's compounding in the wrong direction. Uh, anyway, so let's not continue to cooperate with the impulsive, selfish, futile, short sighted old nature. They all lead to death. They all make relationships suffer. They hurt you and others. Let's, as the Ephesians passage says, do love. Speaking the truth, having compassion, building one another up, forgiving. All right. <coughs> Close your eyes at one more time. This is risky now because we're halfway through the sermon. Now, you really might fall asleep, but <laughs> I'd be sure again. I just want you to think for yourself. What are you known for in your family, at work, and in your neighbourhood? Don't, don't be tough on yourself. Don't be too critical, but try and... Holy Spirit, come and just give us a, a fresh or accurate view of that for a moment.
What is it that God's bringing to your attention? Cool. All right. As you open your eyes, let's talk quickly as we sort of we're starting to try and land this thing. Think about Hebrew and Greek ways of knowing. Some of you have heard this so many times, I'm sorry. But for those who haven't, and uh, you know my son. Ah, oh, I know how to do yeah, I love my son. <laughs> I'm going to sort of pay him out a little bit for a minute. My, my son apparently knows how to do all this stuff, this survival stuff, because he's seen it on YouTube. And I have to say, mate, yeah, so you know how to do it, but have you done it? Do you really know? And, you know, well, he doesn't really know until he's actually done it, does he? So that's it, yet to be seen. But he's excited because he knows about all this stuff. And anyway, I think sometimes we can get excited. I don't know, I've been excited. Uh, when I learn how to know how to do something in my head, the challenge is in the doing. And so for a Greek, you know it as soon as you know it here. And that's our whole education system. And I'm not an expert on education, but obviously it's a bit flawed when, like, you keep getting through just because of what you know. It comes to a point where... Actually, you need to be able to do what you know. And yeah, so, at least by uni, doctors and nurses and physios and all that, they do, and teachers, they do these massive long placements so that they can get what's in their head into their hands and to be able to actually practice and do this stuff properly. So, for a he really, we want to aim for Hebrew knowledge, Hebrew knowing, which is I know because I've done it and I can do it. And that's where the rubber hits the road in relationships. It's in the doing. And uh, that's what we, we become known for. It's built in the doing. A couple of quick stories. I know two cousins right now in Central Australia. Wonderful are under men. They have kids of their own. So they're, you know, you know, they're responsible people, you know, <laughs> family, uh, etc. They're both really nice people. I get along with them quite well separately. They haven't talked to each other since the incident. This is about 18 months ago now. They may not talk for the rest of their lives, according to what they're telling me. You know, and I'm not really in the middle, I'm just neutral. Both are waiting for the other to make the first move. Both are too proud themselves to make the first move. <laughs> they might be waiting a really long time. That story could be familiar to you in your family or in close friends or, or that could be you. Another person I know, used to be an apprentice of mine back in Adelaide, had many legitimate grievances against his father. His father mm, just wasn't a great father. Uh, and the challenges in their relationship were only growing. Like, you know, he didn't really want much to do with his father. His father, by this time, had become a Christian, but which is very different from what he was when he, at the time he was, this apprentice of mine was a young kid. I still remember picking this, my, this apprentice up in the morning. He gets into the car and he tells me, I've forgiven my father. He decided to forgive his father. And it changed everything about their relationship from that day from that day. And the apprentice was at that time about 22 years old. So pretty cool that from 22 for the rest of his life he can have some kind of great relationship with his father or a much hope of a much better relationship. It wasn't just a gift to his father who obviously was, had so much regret about all the mistakes he'd made. But what a huge blessing to the son who had that weight lifted off his shoulder by the choice that he made to forgive. It's pretty powerful. Yeah, I just remember, <laughs> I didn't cry in front of him, but uh, after that day of work, I was just in tears, just so thankful to God. But you could see how much of an immediate impact that forgiveness had had. All right, I know a man in his 60s. This is a good Christian man. He hadn't talked to his sister for about 20 years. He was sitting in church one day, like you and me are today. And it just felt like God said, clearly, not you know, like booming voice or anything, but clearly in his spirit, from the Holy Spirit to his spirit, hey, you need to call your sister. Now, this is the problem with leaving this stuff so long. For 20 years, every single time he's thought of his sister, 
He is built in this little bit of cartilage or scar tissue, if you like, in his soul that says we're not going there, we're not doing that, no, and all the reasons why. You can just imagine flooding through. But this morning, God it just gifted him with this prompt, call your sister. Can you imagine all the fear, all the intrepidation? How is she going to react? It's been so long. What use would it be now? You can just imagine. And maybe some of you here this morning, that's what's happening for you right now. There's this just flood of reasons to not do what God is calling us to do. Anyway, he called. <laughs> he took the initiative. He made the call. And he happened to be within about an hour. This was, so he lived in Adelaide. We were in Queensland at the time. And he was within about an hour of his sister's house. And after that phone call, his sister invited him to her house. And they reconciled. (laughs) Like, this is God at work. This is what God wants to do. He's done it a million times. Why not your life? Why not our life? Oh, so good. So, some helpful thoughts to ground this. And then we'll get out of here. And the reason I put these helpful thoughts together, I think they're helpful, I think it's important, is so that we don't go away knowing what we should do but not really having anything concrete to maybe help us to do the doing. So let's just race through these. First one, we've got that slide. Move in the opposite spirit. So something that helps me a lot is I know what I want to do. This is particularly with my kids. Oh, my gut, my immediate reaction is straight out of the pride wardrobe. Hales will testify to this. And, but then I think, hang on a sec. What would it look like to move in the opposite spirit? Oh, I just really want my kids to learn this lesson. (laughs) Hang on, hang on. But to move in the opposite spirit. My parents did that for me once. I won't tell the full story, but long story short, I told a massive lie in uh, year late year six, early year seven. In fact, no, it was late year six because then I I didn't tell them for like six months the truth. They knew something was up because they're not stupid. Parents aren't stupid, are they? But anyway, (laughs) I felt guilty. I thought, oh, Christmas will come. I'll just forget about it. You know, Christmas will be so good, I'll forget it. Easter will come. It'll be so good, I'll forget it. Oh, my goodness. It was all wait anyway. Come down, you know, into the lounge room one evening and just bawling my eyes out. I'm so sorry, mum and dad, but you know that time when I told you this. Well, actually, it was this. Blah blah blah. And I was ready to cop it because that's that's what I thought. I thought far out. I'm going to cop it. Like I've I've copped some things. I, I, whew, I don't know what's coming my way if I admit to this anyway. If I had to, because of the weight of it. And uh, and you know, I remember my dad just, son, thank you. I think you've had enough punishment from all of this yourself already. And I just, that was like grace personified at that age. You know what I mean? Moving in the opposite spirit. Good on your dad. <laughs> Taught me something about the character of God and the nature of God through that interaction. Rather than my default of, <laughs> oh well, yeah, you are going to cop it. Uh, anyway, that's a little story. So moving in the opposite spirit. So, the spirit of the world and the spirit of God always in constant opposition. In general, our flesh and the spirit of God always in constant opposition. So it can be really helpful to ask, what would moving the opposite spirit look like? In general, it means love instead of hate, generosity instead of jealousy or greed, calm instead of chaos and panic, service instead of entitlement and being served, praying for God to bless those who persecute us, that sort of stuff. All right, let's move to the next one. Laying down your rights. The world or the culture of the world says this. You have a right to privacy, to be respected, to being safe, to financial security, to a fair trial, in general, to be treated fairly, uh, to have a partner, to be entertained. The list goes on. Like there are literal, like, you know, I think America has a Bill of Rights. There's way more than eight rights in there. (laughs) I've just mentioned a few. But these are the ones the culture says that we are entitled to. Now the problem if you buy into that is that every time you don't experience those things in life, you feel like you're being robbed of something that you deserve. Now when we go to the cupboard of attitudes, 
what are we going to put on straight away? Bitterness, resentment, feeling like you're being hard done by. Maybe a bit of jealousy because the person over there doesn't seem to be copying what I'm copying or putting up with what I have to put up with. Well, here's an alternative. And Jesus led the way on this. In Philippians 2, 5 to 11, without going into the full passage, it basically says, despite being in very nature God, Jesus took on the nature of a servant, becoming obedient even to death. Jesus turned the other cheek. Jesus didn't get a fair trial. Jesus was disrespected, but he moved on. <laughs> he didn't like keep on, you know, didn't try to win the argument. Jesus didn't have a house or a worldly inheritance. And this is the guy that we're following. He laid down his rights. Now, I can't remember exactly how old I was, but it would have been roughly 17. This is a big thing in YWAM. Like you have to, I think if you do a discipleship training school there, you spend a good chunk of time like going through this right laying down stuff. I remember getting the journal out, it's a scrappy old A4 exercise book, and writing down all these rights and renouncing all these rights. And I don't know if you have to do that. It's just what I felt to do at the time. That it has been the single most helpful thing for me to just go, you know what? If I'm respected, if I have privacy, if I feel safe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what a gift! Because <laughs> I don't deserve that, but God's given it to me. And in the meantime, if Things don't go my way, which sometimes in life they haven't. I'm not going to go into the details of that right now because there's not time. It's actually okay because I don't have a right. You know, like fundamentally, I've, I've come to the point, no, as a Christian, I don't have a right to be treated fairly in the workplace. Now, I'm not saying if you're being bullied that you should continue just to put up with it and you shouldn't you know, go through the grievance process to have that rectified. But... It's a game changer, laying down your rights. And I do think it was Jesus' example to us. What did Jesus have a right to? He had a right to that relationship with the Father and he had a right to all of the inheritance that came with that. So as God's children, if we're persecuted, if we're disrespected, if, we're put in, if we find ourselves in situations that are unsafe, if we don't get privacy or all the free time that we think that we're entitled to or that the culture would tell us that we're entitled to, let's remember we have an inheritance in Jesus now and forever. And everything that comes with being a son or daughter of the creator of the universe. And that's massive, even though we don't always value it as massive. All right, last one. Don't wait, take the initiative. Don't wait for feelings before doing love and forgiveness. I know someone very close to me who forgave someone. They had a dream about this person and they knifed them in the dream. They had a good reason to knife them in the dream because the person they knifed in the dream had raped someone very close to them. All right, so you can understand why that dream. Now... Is a person in that situation ever going to feel like forgiving that person? Like, I don't I, if that was If that happened to my family, I do not know how. I don't know how. Right? Like, I'll just be honest with you. I don't know how. But, long story short, this person prayerfully and tearfully forgave that person. And same thing as that forgiveness story before. That person has got no clue about, you know, I suppose, the bitterness or the resentment and the anger that that, that act had dumped on everyone who was close to the victim. But that's what happens, isn't it? You know, people here probably who have had some experience or been close to people who have experienced domestic violence, it's the same thing. You know, the bloke thinks they're just hurting the woman in front of them. Well, actually, you're hurting the whole family and the whole community and everyone is connected to the victim. It's a, it's a really serious thing. Same thing. comes down what we do really matters. There's a big difference between thinking I'm going to hit you and actually hitting someone. 
when you actually hit someone, that does a lot of damage, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Anyway, coming back to this one, this person forgave that person and then the feelings came. And in our culture today, it is so, and oh, I'm going to call out the young people, and I don't know if I'm young or old anymore because I've hit the middle. I've hit the middle. I'm in the middle. I've got a four in front of my age now. Uh, but, but, <laughs> for young people in particular, sometimes we can wait so long to feel like we want to do something before we actually do it. If it's the right thing to do, if it's the thing that Jesus has called us to do, do it and then let the feelings come. Or trust that the, just trust God in the doing. It is so easy for me to stand here and say it. But just to say that when I've, you know, gave you one example there, but, but in seeing other people do this and do it thoroughly, it's powerful. And there's a weight that's not on their shoulders anymore. <coughs> but they could have carried to the grave. Like that, that would be so easy to carry to the grave, wouldn't it? We haven't even talked about the pain of divorce or... The pain of, oh, there's so much pain, so much pain. But I'm talking, I saw I'm saying, even with deep, deep, deep hurt, uh, Jesus calls us to put on the new clothes, to be known for love and forgiveness. I'm going to read from Romans 12 and then I pray. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practised hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position and do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the new life for the everlasting truth and for the hope that you give us. Yes, through being able to be in relationship with you, but also, Jesus, through your example. And Lord, if we were to have an honest conversation with you right now, we'd be saying, <laughs> Jesus, we don't know how to do that. Oh, we'd like to, we want to, but we don't know how. Holy Spirit, come and give us the mind of Christ in coming moments and days and weeks to be able to take the next step, whatever that is, in the relationships that we have with one another. God, we know it is your heart that we are reconciled to you but it is also your heart that we are reconciled to one another. Lord, it's your heart that your kids would be known for love and forgiveness, that those are things that we would be able to exercise and express and enjoy for your glory. So God, where strength is needed, may it be given in Jesus' name. Where courage is needed, may it be given in Jesus' name. Humility in Jesus' name.
Lord, whatever we need in the portion that we need it, your grace that flows like a river through this place, may it just be a portion to each and every one of us. For your glory. Amen.